May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Do please have a seat. And uh, welcome back to those of you joining us on the internet. Um, sorry, uh, we had a glitch this morning. I, I have to tell you, we're, we're, we're paying out extra money very soon to have an increased broadband uh, pipe put into this church um, uh, so that we hopefully avoid some of the problems we've just had this morning of the internet just giving up on us. Uh, but welcome back. I'm told you're back with us. Uh, you are very welcome. So, my brothers and sisters... Uh, here and at home, we are in ordinary time once more. Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, Trinity and Corpus Christi last Thursday. Catch up online if you weren't here. Well, they've all passed. And we slide now into week by week contemplation of the everyday teachings of the scriptures. Our gaze shifts away from these dramatic narratives of the great feasts that have inspired us over the last few months, and we settle into a period of diligent study and quiet, effective practice of our faith. Ordinary time. Which is perhaps why the lectionary gives us this morning such a smorgasbord of theological ideas to pursue. As a preacher, my task is to focus on that which I judge is most useful to you at the present time. This morning, I've got quite a lot to draw from, haven't I? Perhaps we could consider the debate between Jesus and the scribes, who accused him of casting out demons by the power of the devil. It's certainly a fascinating topic. And it leads to Jesus announcing that there is one sin and one sin alone which can never be forgiven. He refers to the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which often puzzles many people. I could perhaps remind you of the importance of context in understanding any biblical text. The context is all around this worrisome little phrase. And the context is that the work of healing that Jesus was doing was being ascribed not to the great healer, to the divine spirit of God, but instead to the other guy, to the devil. Now that indeed is blasphemous talk. It would be like saying that the devil is the author of love or that God is the author of disobedience, hatred and war. We need to hear this stern warning of Jesus to, to describe anything hateful, violent or evil as the work of God is indeed a heinous blasphemy. Anyone, for example, who believes that God approves of or instigates war or sickness, they're treading on dangerous ground. It's fine to say that religions are the cause of many wars because regretfully there is truth in that statement. But to suggest that God either approves of such conflict or worse still that he desires it or even foments it, well that's blasphemy. It's fine to wonder why God does not always answer our prayers for healing from sickness or disability. But to suggest that God causes it so that it is perhaps a direct punishment for our sins or, or something like that is blasphemous stuff. But you know all that. We've covered such ground many times together, you and I. So what else as a preacher might I focus on from today's reading? Perhaps I should focus on the idea that a house divided against itself cannot stand which of course Jesus talks about in relation to this crazy idea that his ministry somehow uh, comes from the devil well, this is of course one of those great truisms isn't it the idea that a house divided against itself cannot stand we hear it and we don't often ponder it because it's so plainly obvious now if we were the kind of church 
in which there were different theological factions getting cross and angry with each other, or if our PCC was divided over some great policy issue, or if half the choir was threatening to walk out because they don't like the rector's choice of hymns, you're not, are you? No. Then perhaps this would be a good text for us to consider in depth together. But I have to tell you, I've rarely encountered such a harmonious, kindly, cooperative group of Christians as we have here at St. Faith's. I'm, I'm, I'm not giving you blarney, I mean it. So I would be preaching to the converted, wouldn't I? So, so we're not going to tackle that one this morning. Perhaps we should focus on the little story at the end of the gospel in which Jesus widens the scope of what family means. He says, whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. He invites us to look beyond our narrow human understanding of what family is. He invites us to see each other as not just fellow worshippers, or even fellow travellers on the road of faith, but as actual family. A few weeks ago, we sang, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You. It was a few weeks ago, which is why I didn't choose it for today. <coughs> Excuse me. But it conveys something of the depth of relationship that Jesus calls us, all of us, into and yes you at home as well i will weep when you are weeping when you laugh i'll laugh with you i will share your joy and sorrow till we've seen this journey through but you you know all this when you care for one another with phone calls to each other because you know that one another are lonely. Or when you meet up just for friendship's sake at a safe distance on a park bench or in the churchyard. Or, or when you hold one another in prayer or, or support the needy through the discretionary fund. Then you are living out exactly what Jesus means when he calls us to be brothers and sisters and mothers together. When you welcome to our family table those who are not like you, those who are perhaps of a different race than you, or a different sexual preference or gender identity than you, or a different intellectual ability, or even a different understanding of God than the one you have, then you are being exactly the kind of real family that Jesus is talking about. So we don't need to deal with that topic this morning. So perhaps... There's little from the gospel reading that we desperately need to consider this morning. Perhaps I should just shut up and sit down. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you don't get away that easy. Perhaps I should just take a few final moments to contemplate the words of St. Paul, which Colin read to us just now. Written to a church community not unlike our own, Paul wants his readers not to lose heart. He knows how much has been achieved by those early Christians battling against all the forces that were around them uh, as they sought to bring the kingdom to fruition in places like Corinth and Ephesus and all around the Mediterranean. He wants to encourage them to press on, to keep on living as Christ has called them to live he wants them, by God's grace, to keep on extending that kingdom to more and more people so that there may be, in his words, even more thanksgiving to the glory of God. 
And ultimately, folks, brothers and sisters, that's my prayer for us at the beginning of ordinary time. Let's keep on loving one another. Let's keep on inviting others from very different backgrounds, very different others around our family table. Let's keep on weeping with those who weep and laughing with those who laugh. Let's keep on proclaiming and demonstrating the radical, life-changing love of God. And perhaps then we will discover that ordinary time is not so ordinary after all. Amen. Amen. Amen.